Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, Build a 350-Ship Navy or Bust. And our guest today is joining us from Switzerland, where it is 5 a.m. in the morning. So we really want to thank you for getting up so very early. Um, our guest is Captain uh, James uh, Fennell, U.S. Navy retired. Uh, he formerly was the N2 at Pacific Fleet, U.S. Pacific Fleet, that is, of course. Uh, and he's a real expert on defense affairs, especially defense affairs in the Pacific. So we want to welcome him back to Asia Review. It's great to have you with us from Chile, Switzerland. Thanks, Bill. Good to be here. Great. Well, let me ask a provocative question to get the ball rolling here. Why should the U.S. taxpayer pay for a 350-ship Navy? Well, I think uh, we just have to go back and look at the history of the United States and uh, the value proposition that we get uh, from investing in the Navy that uh, ensures that we are able to buy and sell and trade around the world. Uh, and we've enjoyed that uh, kind of uh, uh, benefit for over 200 years. And the question today is whether or not uh, the Navy that we have will be able to guarantee that same uh, freedom of access to the, the global commons of the maritime domain uh, as we've had in the past. So, in other words, what you're really saying is uh, sea power is a crucial, maybe the most crucial element of U.S. power, global power? I think it's one of the most, I, I wouldn't say it's the most, but it is one of the most critical, yes. And uh, the ability for our uh, uh, ships and, and, and basically this global economy that we have, which uh, this, despite, you know, people's political views on the word global economy, the fact is we buy and sell and trade things around the world. And uh, in order for us to be able to continue to do that and for other uh, parts of the world to be able to do that, you need to have assured access. You need to be able to know that your ships can go into any port in the world and be able to, you know, get raw materials or send finished goods. And we have known in the past where these things aren't always free. Uh, the free access is not always there because uh, rogue nations or state sponsors uh, prevent that. Uh, and so having a strong Navy gives us that a, a flexibility to know that we can go and sell and trade. And uh, the world has benefited from that. And so the question today is, will we be able to continue to benefit uh, from that in the face of a larger uh, TRC Navy and even a Russian Navy? So, uh, okay, you're emphasizing the fact that a Navy is uh, really important to maintaining, open, to maintaining open trading routes, okay, and um, offering economic support. But doesn't it also play a crucial role in the global balance of power? I think it does as well. I think it sends a signal to uh, other nations like uh, the PRC and like Russia and Iran and North Korea uh, that, uh, you know, things that are going on, threats, for instance, from the Korean Peninsula, uh, if you recall last November, uh, the president was able to assemble three carrier strike groups right. and use those as part of his maximum pressure campaign. Mm. It's to be determined how well that will go on the peninsula, but certainly it had uh, a supporting impact. And we can say the same thing in, you know, in the Middle East and other, other areas. Okay, so it's, a, it, it's really more than just maintaining trade routes. It's balance of power. It's also, I, I guess, to go one step further, if there ever is an emergency in any given country, it's probably going to be the Navy that extracts U.S. citizens and, and moves them to safety. Yes, I think there's, there's, there's a multitude of roles that we see. We, you can talk about showing the flag and showing our support for allies. Mm -hmm. Right now, you know, we've just seen the Chinese send one of their hospital ships into the, into the Gulf of Mexico and visiting the Latin American countries. Why are they doing that? Well, somebody in Beijing believes that showing Chinese vessels' presence in America, quote unquote American waters is a way for China to achieve its strategic objectives, which is to diminish the power of the United States and expand the power of, of the PRC. You know, I feel I've done some thinking about that, too, and it seems to me that, um, you know, I, and, you know, right at the second, I can't think of that horrific hurricane that struck Puerto Rico and all those 
um, uh, island nations and colonies in the Caribbean, and it really left them in ruin. Um, and this created great opportunity for China, in my view, because China, you know, plays checkbook diplomacy. Oh, you're sort of down and out here. We got some money for you. Great opportunity for China in the soft underbelly of the United States. And we already know there's Chinese listening posts in Cuba. This is a great opportunity for China. I think it, I think it is. Uh, I think right now that they're they still have some messaging issues they've got to take care of in their own waters. Mm -hmm. And so when the Philippines or recently this uh, tsunami earthquake that hit uh, Indonesia, you saw China move to help, but you didn't see them move their Navy. And so they've been kind of slow off the mark in the last five years in certain areas in terms of dispatching naval forces to provide uh, uh, support in their own region. And so I think it may be a couple of more years before they would try to do something in our own region. But clearly sending this hospital ship now is kind of a, uh, the way that the Chinese are testing the waters. They're putting, the, putting a big toe in the pool, if you will, in terms of uh, the Western Hemisphere. Mm, interesting. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, it, it also seems to me that, um, y y you know, um, the greater the presence or the threat of a presence of China in the Caribbean, the more I would suppose people in Beijing would think that will take America's attention off of Asia. Because America only has so many resources, and if they're worried about their soft underbelly, that's going to be an area of great concern to them. And they'll take some attention, some of their attention off of us. And of course, that's what they want. They want us out of Asia. Correct. And I think I, I agree completely. And I think you saw, uh, you know, the vice president make a speech uh, about, uh, you know, China here on October 4th and mentioned their strategic ends or aims. And then you also just had uh, Secretary Pompeo down in uh, Latin America speaking about uh, China's involvement down there. So I think uh, it's very clear that China's using the, you know, the Go uh, Wei Chi analogy to put chips all over the globe to stretch uh, stretch our resources and stretch our uh, capacities. You know, I, you know, I, and it's also interesting too. It's obvious that the Caribbean is a uh, an area of interest to in the United States. It was just a few years ago that the United States Navy reactivated um, what it was it the Fourth Fleet, the Caribbean Fleet, and then what was it, a few months ago, they reactivated the Second Fleet because of Russian patrolling up and down the East Coast. Um, so we definitely have our challenges. I just wonder sometimes if this effort of China in the Caribbean and this increased patrolling of the Russians up and down the East Coast is somehow coordinated between Beijing and Moscow. I think it's, I, I'm convinced that there's coordination between uh, Putin and uh, Xi uh, and their militaries. Uh, the fact that the PLA uh, participated in Vostok 2018 here earlier in the year, a couple of months ago, uh, is, is a very significant uh, event in history, especially for the Russians. This is the premier Russian national uh, security exercise uh, that they've run for, for decades. Uh, but it's exclusively been, you know, the, the Russians uh, and their focus on their national defense and the inclusion of the significant portion of uh, uh, Chinese PLA uh, troops, not so, not so much their Navy didn't participate this time, but the fact that Chinese uh, ground forces and Chinese air forces and rocket forces were involved with the uh, Vostok 2018 uh, should not go unnoticed and should be a signal uh, to the West uh, and the rest of the free world that, that China and Russia are working together. And they've got a lot of problems, and I know that they've got mutual distrust, but They've got a lot more in common right now, and I think what you just described is clearly not happenstance. Mm. Mm. Interesting, interesting. Well, um, okay, let's say that um, the United States achieved this goal of building a 350-ship Navy. Would most of those added ships be dedicated to the Western Pacific? I think uh, that's to be determined. You know, uh, right at the end of the previous administration, uh, the Secretary of Defense 
announced the 60-40 split, 60% of the U.S. Navy to the Pacific, 40% to the Atlantic. I think there's been a little bit of a, uh, a pendulum swing back uh, in terms of, I'm not sure about total numbers. I think it's still closer in terms of surface ships still being 60% uh, in submarines. Uh, but I think there's an intent there, as you mentioned, the reestablishment of Second Fleet, uh, that we clearly have issues uh, in the Atlantic, uh, and therefore we need resources there. And the focus that you've just probably seen in the last week with uh, one of our carrier strike groups operating above the Arctic Circle uh, on that side in the, in the Atlantic, uh, haven't done that since 30 years, is, an, is a testament to this concern that we have about the Russian threat. I would just add, I think in the next five to ten years, you're going to start seeing Chinese surface combatants and submarines operating in the Atlantic as well. Chinese submarines? Yes. Uh, that's going to be really interesting. Chinese and Russian submarines off, uh, operating off the shores of the U.S. That's going to be very challenging. Well, um, okay. China, as we said, is the key challenge here, and Russia is um, a, close, uh, a close second. But just how good is a Chinese Navy? How good is the Russian Navy? I think uh, clearly uh, the Chinese Navy is, is much more capable than I think the average uh, person has been led to believe. If you read the vast majority of assessments about the Chinese Navy over the last just five years, uh, there's still this uh, mindset uh, from the academic community uh, that, that says that the Chinese Navy isn't that capable. Uh, but that's not my assessment. And I retired three and a half years ago, uh, almost four years ago now, and uh, when I left, I was telling people that the Chinese Navy uh, was a threat. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for that. One is building quality warships. They may not be as good as ours in some sense, in, in, in some senses, but they're quality warships, they're sustained warships, they've been running operations in the Gulf of Aden for a decade without any serious problems. They're sending ships into the Baltic, into the Mediterranean, trans, uh, you know, circ circumnavigating the African continent, sending them into the, the, you know, Caribbean, as we just discussed. So they're able to send ships around the world and sustain them. They're good quality ships, and the thing that they have is, uh, numbers. They have numbers of platforms, so they have a lot of ships. As of 2015, my assessment is that in terms of surface combatants, they had over 330 major surface combatants. I'm not talking about small patrol boats. And they had over 66 uh, submarines. Mm. So they were already in 2015 a Navy force larger than the U.S. Navy. Mm. That's one thing. But hulls aren't the only thing that counts. What counts is firepower. And what the Chinese surface force and subsurface force and air forces have is anti-ship cruise missiles. And so they built a naval force that's been designed to kill and sink other navies. Mm. And I think that's the real, the real test. And then, you know, you can say, well, haven't been tested in combat. That's true. But the U.S. Navy hasn't been tested in naval combat either since, uh, you know, since World War II, essentially. Uh, and China does a lot of testing and exercising in their home, own home waters, and they've been doing it in a joint way with all their services under what they call complex electromagnetic environment. And so they're really training for war. They have been training for war for well over a decade. And I've seen things that suggest that the Chinese are able to fire uh, anti-ship cruise missiles from ships, submarines, and aircraft multiple vectors on multiple times on target or simultaneous time on target against uh, targets that are maneuvering. And so uh, they're not unsophisticated. They have, they have lots of things still to learn. Uh, they have uh, experience to yet gain, uh, but they are not a force that we can just uh, throw away and say, ah, they, we don't have to worry about that for another 20 years, because people have been saying that for 20 years. That's true. I mean, I think America has historically underestimated Asian people. It doesn't matter if they're Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, Vietnamese, whoever. The United States has a very bad history of underestimating Asian people. I agree. Uh, I, I mean, 
you know, there's all kinds of examples. I mean, okay, you could say that the United States fought with one hand tied behind its back in Vietnam, but we lost. As sadly as that is to say, it's the truth of the matter. And I know a lot of people don't want to accept that, but it's true. Um, we underestimated the uh, Vietnamese. We underestimated the Koreans, North Koreans, for a long time. Just, you know, kind of country hicks, you know? These country hicks have China and the United States falling all over themselves. They're extremely cagey. No one should underestimate them. Uh, the Japanese, I was just going to say, the Japanese in the 80s nearly blew us off the block. Um, luckily, because of a lack of regulation, their economy somewhat imploded and uh, is just more or less coming out of it now. Uh, but um, I, I, I cut you off, I think. We've got about 30 seconds until the break, I'm told. So can we get this in quick? Yeah, I would just say that I think the difference today is We've always kind of uh, denied uh, the, the resourcefulness of Asian nations concerning land warfare. I think what's, what I would like to put a spin on is it's about naval warfare, and it's naval warfare east of the second island chain, towards the third island chain, the Hawaiian area, and, mm -hmm. presume, and in the future towards our west coast. Right, right. Good point. And that's a great place to take a break here. You're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, our show today... Build a 350-ship U.S. Navy or bus. And our guest is Captain um, Jim Fennell, U.S. Navy retired. He's joining us from Switzerland in the real early hours there, where it's about 5.15 in the morning in Switzerland. So we really appreciate him getting up so early just to join us. And we'll be back in one minute. Hello. My name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pamai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, building a 350-ship U.S. Navy or bus. And our guest today is uh, Captain Jim Fennell, a United States Navy retired. Before he retired, nearly four years ago now, uh, he was the N2 at U.S. Pacific Fleet. Uh, he's very active in participating in various conferences around the world, writing all sorts of papers and chapters of books, and so we have a real expert. Um, well, you know, I made this observation uh, on one of my, on many of my trips to China. Um, the Chinese like to build things fast. They take pride in building things fast. I, I can, and I'm particularly thinking of like, uh, residential, what we might call condominiums, and, and other kind of fancy living places. However, five or six years down the road, these places begin to show uh, premature wear and tear, uh, and the quality of construction begins to surface. So I'm just kind of wondering if this uh, might carry over to naval vessels. I mean, because China's turning out naval vessels left and right, left and right. I, I, I mean, the record always seems to go up. The rapidity with which they produce ships seems to increase all the time. And I'm just, the skeptical side of me wonders just how well built are these ships? How long are they going to hold up? Now, you I think, suggested uh, in an earlier segment that they're doing a pretty darn good job at it. But let, let's probe this one a little bit deeper. Sure. Um, I've been aboard a number of Chinese uh, uh, warships over the, the course of my career and was just uh, up in uh, Kiel 
in August and was happened to be uh, to go on board one of their Junkai 2 class frigates, the 515, Bing Zhao. Uh, and I've been on a number of, 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 of those uh, Junkai 2s, which are uh, you know, a newer, newer version of uh, the kind of ships that you're talking about that are being pumped out. And again, they may not have the same standards as U.S. Navy warships, but these are ships that we're watching and observing operate you know, thousands of miles from the mainland of China in the Gulf of Aden, in the Mediterranean, in the Baltic, where I was, as again, was on board one of their ships. And uh, they're well-maintained. Uh, they seem to be well-built. Uh, you can, one could argue that they may not be built for survivability in a, in a naval conflict, but uh, let's be honest, the ships that the U.S. Navy's building today are, are the kind of the same caliber. We're, we don't build ships like we did in World War II anymore with, mm -hmm. you know, six or eight inch thick steel in the hulls and able to withstand shells bouncing off and things like that. I mean, we, most ships today around the world are built a much lighter construction and, and are much more vulnerable to uh, shipboard attack. Mm. Uh, but that said, uh, the Chinese ships are operating. So I think the proof is in the fact that they're operating, sustaining these operations uh, with these ships. Uh, and they are, as you said, pumping them out. You know, one of the Chinese ship so is called the Zhangdao class uh, Corvette, the Type 056, and the Chinese nickname for that is the Dumpling, because they're just pumping them out like you would find in a, a street side vendor with a dumpling soup. They're just making more and more of these dumplings, and so the Chinese <laughs> machine uh, is able to pump these out. Uh, but I and I and I am cognizant of what you said about the other areas of China where things aren't made just right, and then they end up. Uh, you know, cutting corners and then the service life is cut in, in houses and things of that nature. But I see a marked difference uh, in the PLA Navy. And I give a lot of that credit to Admiral Wu Shengli, the former mm -hmm. commander of the PLA Navy. And Admiral Wu understood what it meant to build a world-class Navy. And I think he was uh, meticulous in his approach to building this Navy. And uh, almost rabid in his demand for excellence. And I've been on one of their submarines, a Song-class submarine in 2009 in Qingdao, and I was on board with our, our chief of naval operations, our commander of the 7th Fleet, and we all walked away from there saying they get it. They know how to build things of a high quality. Wow, interesting. Well, uh, okay, now let's say that the U.S. decides finally, yes, we're going to have a 350-ship Navy. Well, the argument I've seen raised is, yeah, okay, great, 350 ship Navy, good, let's go for it. But the problem is, do we have the industrial capacity to do that? We seem to have only a limited number of shipyards these days. And if that's the case, I wonder if we would ever consider outsourcing the technologically less sensitive parts of a ship, like uh, maybe the hulls could be built in, say, like a Taiwan shipyard. And then the, 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 you know, the electronics and all be installed in the United States. Uh, so I guess my question there has two parts. Do we have the industrial capacity? And if not, would we ever consider outsourcing? Uh, to answer the first question, the answer is no. And as you probably just saw in the last couple of weeks, the administration released a year-long study about the defense industrial base of the United States and specifically highlighted uh, the deficiencies that the U.S. has in, ship, in the shipbuilding arena. And so uh, it, this is a problem that folks have kind of shied away from talking about for decades. Uh, and uh, this administration, to their credit, has highlighted this and said this is unacceptable. We're at risk in several key areas for single sourcing on several key, uh, key areas of, of ship production. Uh, and you, you can read the report to, to find that out. There's also a classified version, which I haven't obviously seen, but I mean, there's been a lot of analysis, a whole of government uh, assessment that this was made. It wasn't just made by the Department of Defense. This was made uh, with every uh, you know, U.S. Uh, agency that had a, a role and responsibility in looking into these issues. So that's the first thing. To your second question, should we outsource it? Uh, well, we may be able to do some things, but I think the administration's position is, no, we don't want to outsource it. That's the problem. We've outsourced too many areas, and we need to bring these industries back into the United States. 
uh, and, and have the ability to produce warships uh, on our own in a time of crisis when we can't rely on anybody else uh, for whatever reason. Not, and we can go into what those reasons would be. But the fact is uh, there's a deep desire by this administration to be able to bring back the capacity to bring and build ships uh, of all kinds, military sea command ships, warships, submarines. Uh, uh, and so I think that's where they want to go. Uh, the problem is it takes a while to get there. And as, you know, it's a, a kind of a free market uh, capitalist nation, we don't really like the government dictating the market. So mm. there's going to be uh, some balancing there that has to go on. But I think in terms of national security, I think we're on the right path of trying to bring back this capacity in the United States. And I think there'll be an added benefit, obviously, uh, which I think the president very much cares about, which is produce more jobs in the United States. Right, right. Well, you know, I have um, two things come to mind here. One is that during the Reagan administration, uh, Reagan wanted to ramp up the size of the military. And at that time, as I recall, as I understand, uh, he authorized the Navy to build a number of uh, frigates. Now, as far as I know, I'm an old Army guy here, so, you know, I might be getting these things a little bit um, wrong, but you straighten me out if I do. Um, okay, Reagan, to build up the Navy in his day, he authorized the building of frigates. Okay, now a lot of these frigates, as I understand it, are coming of age, and they're about, they should be, probably be retired. So, what kind of ship would the Navy build to take the place of frigates? Would it build a, a, a more um, modern, newer frigate? Or would it replace the, the dwindling number of frigates with a new class of ship? I think the Navy is examining all the options that you just listed. Uh, but in terms of getting something quick Jim, I got to interrupt you. We have one minute left, I just was told. So find right. that clock. It always does it to us. Yeah, we could talk for hours. Uh, I would say that the the, easy, uh, the quickest answer is we have a number of ships that are, uh, as you said, ready to you know go through normal life, uh, ceasing their estimated or planned life. We could extend those years some, and we have ships and mothballs that we could bring out and uh, you know for some amount of effort, less than building brand new ships, we could we could rapidly increase our fleet size uh, by just doing those two actions. But I think our system inside the Pentagon is designed to find something shiny and new and build something uh, that will cost millions of dollars, like the Zumwalt class uh, uh, cruiser, uh, right. which, you know, is insane, in my opinion. So if we're really serious about numbers, there's ways to get after it right now uh, for a relatively low cost. Okay, great. Well, um I want to pop in this question here, but I, I think we're out of time. So we'll just leave it there and pick it up the next time. But thank you so much for joining us. And again, thank you. Thank you so much for getting up so early in the morning. Every time you're on the show, we get you up out of bed early. Begin to feel guilty here. Uh, so uh, thanks again for jo uh, joining us today from Switzerland. Thank you for joining us. Please join me again next week when my guest will be former Taiwan Defense Minister, Dr. Michael Tsai. Dr. Tsai not only is a defense authority, a defense expert, he also is a very prominent figure in the politically potent Taiwan Presbyterian Church. We'll see you then.